wrap up. I, I kind of had this on the, you know, it was on the stove. It was cooking. And, um, but uh, I originally only started out to just teach a couple of messages along these lines. And, and, uh, and, uh, and like I said, this is something I still had and I couldn't get some direction. I, I, I really, in light of what some of the things that's happened in the nation, uh, you know, in, I had thought maybe I might talk about the need for spiritual awakening, but that it didn't seem right to the Lord. And, and so, uh, I, again, you'll benefit from this this morning, I, I, I trust. Amen. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity again to share your word and to teach and to preach your gospel. I thank you, Father, that your word's good seed and when it's sown on good ground in our lives, I believe it produces good fruit. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Now, we've been kind of using as our, our text, you know, uh, our, our theme for this series out of 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, verses 7 and 8. We've, you know, we're, there's not time. I've got too much to say this morning to repeat very much of anything that I have said. But none of us will live life without burden or without care. Having burden, having care, all right? Having some fear or anxiety is, is something that everybody does and will experience in life. But thank God, because of the toll that it can take upon us, the, the, the Scripture grants us some answers, and, and Christ is there to provide us help. 1 Peter 5, 7, and 8 says, Casting all your care, everybody say all your care, all your care. upon Him, for He cares for you. Be sober, be alert, be vigilant, because your adversary, and we do have an adversary, I'm, I'm never trying to build people's faith in the devil, but it'd be a foolish thing to not believe that there is an enemy, a devil. All right? A wicked one. Scripture calls him Lucifer. We have an adversary, the devil. And the Bible says, and he walks about as a roaring, roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, we have established the fact that care is something that we can roll off on the Lord. And you know in life there's always multiple ways that one can help them help yourself, both in the natural and the same is true spiritually. You know spiritually there is many ways that God can intervene in your life. He can intervene in your life because he just sends somebody across your path, just the right person. He can intervene because you're at the right place in the right time and you hear what you need to hear. He can intervene in your life and he he might Spontaneously, you might have a miracle in your life. Somebody may stand together in agreement with you. The Bible says, if two shall agree as touching anything, it will be done of our Father which is in heaven. There's multiple ways that God can intervene in your life. And the same is true in relationship to what I'm saying this morning. We're talking about dealing with, with burdens, with the load, with the care, with a yoke upon our back. We're going to turn to Isaiah 10, 27. And it's going to be a very familiar scripture. And, it's in, in for anybody that has uh, uh, you know, listened to you know, some impassioned preachers, a Pentecostal, charismatic type minister, uh, uh, but just an impassioned minister. This is a great preaching text. And this guy likes good preaching texts. All right. And uh, though in this series, I've almost primarily just taught, okay? I love to preach. My strength is teaching, though. But I love to preach. Isaiah 10, 27 says, And it came to pass in that day that the burden, everybody say burden. burden. Say we're talking about the burden, right? Israel was living underneath the burden of a hard taskmaster at this time. Egypt was not the only time Israel was in bondage. And so here they are again, and the Assyrians are the ones that are afflicting them. And so it came to pass in that day that his burden shall be what? Taken away from your shoulder. Now, you would find that, again, if you go back into antiquity, if you go back into biblical times, the time of Christ, and certainly previous to that, you understand culture changed so, much, so little for hundreds and thousands of years, it was just repeated itself. 
But when you think about, first of all, we say we can roll our cares on the, on the Lord. Why? Because he can bear the burden. Uh, it, it's a, you know, the Bible said he humbled himself and came to earth. All right? These are the things that humble him. When you come to earth and you become the beast of burden for other people, that's humbling. He bears your care, your worries, your fears, your anxiety. All right? And so we understand that, you know, that many times that, that burden or that, that yoke that would be upon people, you can certainly see maybe the oxen out in the field. And that oxen, he's, you know, he's got the yoke around him, and the yoke is either pulling a wagon, or it's pulling a plow, or maybe it's moving a rock, but it's got a yoke on it. And the yoke is tied to the burden. Well, he said that the burden shall be taken off your shoulder. Now, the other picture that you might get is that you, you would see a, a picture of a person and they would have a yoke and maybe two huge buckets of water on either side of it. And, and again, what was the yoke tied to? The yoke was tied to the weight, to the burden. And it was the only way that they had to move water. Could you imagine maybe having to walk a mile to go get your water? And it would, again, it would be heavy. That's a burden. Now, they're living under Syrian tyranny here. They're, they, are their, they have taken them captivity. They are in, they are in bondage. And so they are their, their slaves, their, their servants, and they have great burdens upon their, their shoulders. He shall take away, take it off your shoulder, and the yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because... Of the anointing. Now we're going to come back to that phrase in just a little bit. Now I do want you to know that I am one that does believe that the anointing of God and the anointing upon the person of Jesus Christ, all right, as the Son of God, does deliver us from burdens. Now we look in Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 15 and 16. Now I said to them, who do men say that I am? I love this verse. Simon Peter, he answered and said, You are the Christ, Son of the living God. Who do men say that? Well, some say you're Jeremiah, some others say one of the apostles. What did Peter say? Thou art the Christ. Now every time, every time you see Christ in the New Testament, they could have just as correctly just wrote in the anointed one. Sometimes, in some translations, they say Messiah. But Messiah, as Christ, is translated the Anointed One. So Jesus is what? He is the Anointed One. Now, he's, again, if I refer to Isaiah, and he says, and, you know, and the anointing shall, if you will, break or destroy the yoke. So here we have Christ, and we already understand, we've well established the fact that He is the burden bearer. And He is very capable of taking our burdens, our worries, our cares, our fears, our frustrations, our anxieties. Now here's what anointing is. You know, sometimes you hear a word, you say, well, what's, a, what's it mean, you know? We understand it as something spiritual. Well, it's a word that you could, certainly could spend some amount of time on, but these will suffice for the moment. Anointed is this. It's God's blessing and His call upon one's life. See, it is obvious. All right, the Bible says that Jesus had the Spirit without measure. Was that God's blessing on His life? Absolutely. Did He have a call? Didn't He, Dennis? He had a call in His life. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to do the will of the Father. He came to destroy the works of the enemy. I could go on about that mission. So the anointing is both God's blessing and call on one's life, through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, there is no anointing. All right? You can pull Crisco all over something and it won't be holy. Yeah. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, anointing the sick, paraphrase, save the sick, the Lord raise them up. There was a couple one time they'd never prayed for anybody sick, but they read that in the Bible. And they said, wow, we need to anoint somebody with oil. Someone was bad sick. They was in bed. They couldn't get out. They called a few friends around. They said, you know, we've read this in the Bible, and they're, they're terribly sick, and we've, we, we, you know, they've been to the doctor. They're just not getting any better. What in the world are we going to do? 
They said, but we've read this verse in James. You know, you call for the elders of church, so they called some friends around, you know, people that were leaders in the church, said, we're, we're going to pray for them. They get out a bottle of Crisco, poured it all over that person, just poured it all over them. But you know what? God honored them, all right? But you can pour Crisco all over somebody and God won't be there, okay? But God was there, all right? He intervened. He, he, he blessed their obedience, amen? He blessed their obedience. There, there's, there's nothing holy about oil, okay? But there is always something holy about obedience. And if he says anoint with oil, you should do it. God's blessing and call upon one life through what? The work of the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, through the anointing. All right? So we're, we're talking about God's blessing, His calling. So that certainly includes Christ, but I want you to know it also includes you. We are His anointed. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Look at somebody. Say, you're anointed. All right. Now look at somebody else. Say, I'm anointed. We're not as near as comfortable saying that. Amen. Now, through the anointing, God does this. He empowers. Right? God protects. And God blesses. You ever have somebody come into your life, and just because of the, just of the giftings in their lives, it, it may be through, through kindness, it may through, be through charity, it may be through wisdom, but their life just blesses you. Well, that is the anointing. Right? That is the anointing. The anointing doesn't have to give you goosebumps, and I like goosebumps. I'm all about them. I'm a goosebump waiting to happen, James. All right. It's got, God empowers, God protects, and again, God blesses. Now, you think about the king in the Old Testament. What was his responsibility? One of his main responsibility was to protect the kingdom. He was what? He was anointed to do that. They needed someone to lead. He was anointed to do that. So it's what? It's God's blessing, all right? If you will, let's say it this way. His blessing to fulfill his calling on your life. Now, when you think about the person of Christ, boy, does that fit. All right? God's blessing upon his life. He is what? The Savior of the world. He has come to deliver mankind, primarily concerning the burden of sin, but also the impact of sin upon humanity. So he fulfills that. He's, he, has a, he, you know, he has the blessing of God. He has a calling of God. God empowers him, protected him, and blesses him. Now look at these things. I'm still talking about Christ now. Remember, because he's the one who, 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 you know, who bears, who we roll our burdens over on. And it is his, his action in our lives by which we find relief. Now look at this says in Acts 10.38. In Acts 10.38, and it says how God anointed. See, there's that word again. What did he do? He blessed. He blessed the calling that was upon his life. He gave him what? He gave him power. He, gave, he, he helped him to protect. He helped him to provide. He helped him to bless the multitude. You think about when he fed the multitude. All right? God was providing for his people. And who was anointed to do that? Jesus. What was he doing? They were hungry at that time. He was relieving that burden upon their lives. Now Acts 10 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? With the Holy Ghost and power, so there's his provision, okay? There's the, you see the impact of the anointing. But what did he anoint him with? With the Holy Ghost and power. And he went about doing good and healing all that were what? Oppressed. We need the work of Christ in our lives. We need that anointed work because the enemy oppresses people. Everybody say oppressed again. Now, you know, you, oppression, you, you could be down. You can be mel melancholic, depressed. That, that, that is oppression. Now, I'm not saying you don't have something else going on in your life. I'm not saying that there's no, there's no chemical imbalance. I'm not saying that there's not trauma that caused it. I'm saying there's an enemy. You can live in fear. That's an oppression. You can never be able to live ahead, and maybe the enemy's got you convinced that you must always be poor and broke. And, and I, I'm not one of these guys out here in left field and thinks everybody ought to be a millionaire, but I do serve a God who meets every believer's need according to his riches in glory. Amen? He's a provider. But see, if, you, if, you, if, if, if one is stuck in poverty, that is, that is, that is an oppression. The enemy brings sickness and disease our ways. It is an oppression. People say, well, I don't believe that. Then why do you go to a doctor? Yeah. 
Now, I've had good Christian people say, well, I don't believe in that healing stuff. I said, well, then you're, you, you don't go to the doctor. You're getting out of the will of God. It makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Sometimes we just don't think, you know, you know, you know beyond our face, you know, beyond ourselves. And, you know, and we say things that don't even make sense. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Now we go to Luke 4.18. Right, we're talking about the person of Christ. What is Christ is anointed, if you will, to be the burden bearer, to be the deliverer, all right? to free us from the bands of oppression. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to what? Preach the gospel to who? The poor. That's the poor in spirit. That's, that's just the... That's, but that is the poor. He has sent me to heal the what? The brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to who? To the captives. The recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty all that are what? Oppressed. Yet word just keeps coming up. See, it's the enemy's attack upon your life. What does the anointing do? The anointing brings relief and release from that. I believe that. It is absolutely scriptural. Levit Leviticus 26.13 I am the Lord your God. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. All right? You don't have to live in slavery. You don't have to live in bondage. You don't have to live under oppression. You don't have to live with the, the bands of, of wickedness. I have broken the bands of your what? Yoke. And made you to walk upright. Now you understand. It gets heavy. And you just can't walk upright. Well, you know, you get that? There's a lot of spiritual significance there. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But if you can't walk upright, what's he trying to impact? Your right standing with God. Pretty deep, isn't it? Significant. So we see that once again, that certainly all the way from 1 Peter, we were able to roll our work our burdens, our worries, our fears, our anxieties, all right? Now, mind you, we, we have dealt with, I can't repeat everything I've said every week, but that's not to say that you don't roll that off one time and it doesn't come back. You just keep rolling until that moment comes when you've rolled it the final time. All right? So, we, again, we've established the fact that he does bear. It is clear that Christ, the anointed one, and again, every time you see Christ in Scripture, it could have been translated Messiah, but it could absolutely, which certainly defines his mission, the anointed one. One who, once again, who has God's blessing and call upon his life. All right? Uh, you know, the blessing is to fulfill that call. And so he is what? The anointed one. It is clear that Christ, the anointed one, not only can, but does break the bands of oppression. So I've established that. I've, I've, I've spent several minutes doing it. Let me take you back now to Isaiah 10, 27, and tell you that people miss this verse. And it's misapplied. I've already said, I do believe the anointing sets people free. Right? Let's read Isaiah 10, 27. And it came to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So again, I, this is one of these verses. It just makes for great preaching, you know. And, you know, and ah, if you just get under the anointing and you just... And, and I'm for that. I already established that fact, didn't I? Okay, how important the anointing is. But here's the deal. When you don't see what this verse really says, you miss, remember, there's more than one way God can help you. He can send someone your way. Somebody might pray for you. They might give you something. You might hear the right thing at the right time, at the right moment. God might spontaneously do a miracle in your life. You may just stand in faith until the answer comes. There's lots of, lots of ways from God to get to here to get to you, right? All right, all right. So we see this. And it says, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Now, I believe in anointed preaching. I believe in anointed teaching. I believe in anointed prayer. Uh, we've already established that fact. Except, that's not the way that should read. By goodness, it preaches good. It preaches good. And you know what? The next time you hear somebody preach it that way, I want you to know that we've already established the fact that it's a biblical truth. It's just not what this verse says. You say, oh, Bill, well, you stay with me now, okay? Just stay with me. 
All right, watch this. This is going to help you. This going to help you. You'll like this, Ray. You could, this is going to help, John. All right. I've, you know, been 20 years ago, <clears throat> now, 20 years ago, I read that verse, and I read it in multiple translations. And I said, wow, these don't agree. And I've thought about it for 20 years. Isaiah 61.1. Now, remember we see the word, let me, you know, I just identify once again in Isaiah 10.27. Where I, again, the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Now, we've already established, I'm not saying that the anointing doesn't, doesn't bring people freedom and break the bands of the burdens that are upon people's lives. I'm just going to prove the fact that that's not what that verse says. And there's something, there's something there enormously important if you don't see that you miss a way that will mean everything to you. Now Isaiah 61.1. Remember Luke 4.16? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for it anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to bring deliverance to the captive, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them the bruised, to preach the accept year of the Lord and Jesus said then and he says this day this scripture is fulfilled in your ears and it says and all the people's eyes were fastened upon him why because he was announcing the anointed one is here the Messiah he's quoting Isaiah 61 1 many of you already knew that but we'll point it out again now the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the Good tidings to the poor. Now, rather than me just read the whole thing, I stop, I underlined anointing. All right? Here's the Hebrew word for it. Meshach. All right? That is the Old Testament word for anointings. Meshach. When you see the word, like when they, when they anointed David the king, it's Meshach. When you read that in Psalms, it talks about you know the oil running down their the, the about the anointing oil coming down on their head and running down off their beard. It's mashak. The word anoint comes from the shepherds. What the shepherds would do was pour oil on the sheep's ears or down on their heads, but it would keep the, the the flies and the ticks and the bugs from getting inside their ears and making them sick and many times dying from it. It what 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 was it? The anointing was kind of a protection for their flock. Why does God have an anointing? It's a protection for his flock. I've, we've established that. I spent a long time doing that, okay? All right. But that's the word. When you go, all right, when you go back to Isaiah 10, 27, and, you, and we get to the latter part of that verse, and his yoke, all right, remember he's going to take away from off your shoulder, and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. It's a different word. It's Shemin. The only thing they have in common is that they both have, one of their definitions is to have oil in them. But see, there's a difference between oil that you pour on something, all right, or you're talking about fat. Fat. What's a bear store up? Fat. Why did it hunt whales? fat. And, and, and you're, talking about, you're talking about enormous beasts. They're enormous. One of the things that, you know, that makes a, a boar so big is the, the, it's the, the fat and the muscle and the tissue. So follow this in the NIV. In that day, the burden will be lifted from your shoulders. Their yoke from your neck and the yoke will be broken because you've grown so fat. Now stay with me here. Now you think about, they got a young ox. Right? Landowner, he's, got, he's bought him a young ox. He's fixed that ox up in his burden. You know, and, you know, and he starts out pulling the little plow. And for years, he, can just, he gets to where he can really pull that little plow. But now as they feed him and as he's out there in the field and as he's plowing, he's growing. And you know what happens one day? Boom! The yoke breaks off of it. Because why? Because this young ox has become this big, muscular beast. And the yoke was what? Broken. It was destroyed. Look at this verse a little closer, okay? 
Why is the yoke broken? Bring up my underline. Because you've grown. Because you what? Because you've grown. Amen. Because you've grown. See, can you understand? You miss, you miss a whole deal here. So in the, in the meantime, you think that you've got to find somebody that's got a strong anointing on their life to get you some help, and that can't help. Didn't I say that? Yeah. Or something extraordinary. You need a miracle. I believe miracles. Everybody, yeah. Yeah. But listen, this is, this, is not just, this is not just a principle. This is a law, man. This is a fact. Why will the yoke be destroyed? Because you've grown so much. You've grown so much. And as you grow, just like the ox, that there's one day as you grow in this relationship with Christ, that one day you begin to hear a pop and a crack and the yoke comes off. Why? Because you've outgrown your yoke. Yeah. Yeah. You've, what? you've outgrown the burden. You've grown closer to Him. Spiritually, I'm speaking. Spiritually, you can outgrow your burden. You can outgrow your burden. See, now that's not me. That's what the Scripture says. It's very clear. Again. He says, and your yoke will be broken because you what? For, for, you know, I mean, the word fat is important because it's talking about you, you're beginning to take on size. You're beginning to take on maturity. You're beginning to get stronger. But it just it identifies it so clearly. Because you have grown. Not because somebody come and, and I'm for that. Somebody prayed for you because somebody anointed you with oil. And I'm for that. I mean, I've, I, I spent a lot of time establishing that. See, I, I would never make light of anything that is a work of God in their lives. But listen, you don't just have to be in the right place at the right time to grow every moment, every day, is the right place and the right time. Amen. Every day, every moment. Go to, see, again, you can, out, you can outgrow that burden. See, you can, you can break the heavy yoke of oppression. All right? But listen to this. You can break the heavy yoke of oppression by growing into a yoke of discipleship. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Right, you understand how now you see how things connect. Watch how this connects. Jesus says in Matthew 11, come, remember he said verse 20, Come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you, you rest. All right, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. What's the key word there? Learn. What's he talking about? Be discipled. Amen. See, walk with me. Get in this yoke with me. You get in that yoke with him and pretty soon what happens? Oh, you, you just begin to grow. You trade, all right? You trade that old heavy yoke, all right, for a yoke of discipleship, for learning, for growing. Look at this. Ephesians 4.15 says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up, what? Into Him. Who is what? Who is the head that is Christ? Everybody... You know, of course, lots of us years ago, they used to have a weekly show. You know, the Hulk didn't go to the big screen. He went from comic books to, to a weekly TV show. And uh, what was his name? Bruce, Bruce what? Banner. Bruce Banner. Who was it? Remember that guy who played him? It was two different guys. Uh, Lou Ferrigno played, played the guy who split his clothes out all the time, you know? And so Lou Ferrigno, you know, which he was, he was, he was Mr. Universe at one time, you know? 
And, uh, uh, and, you know, and, and, and so, you know, when all that gamma rays and all that stuff would be working, you know, he'd begin to, he'd begin to shake and he'd begin to tremble. And pretty soon, boom, I mean, just everything's just split off of him. All right. Now, listen, all right, we're not talking about a superhero, though. Well, we're talking about the powerful person of Jesus Christ. We what? We grow up into him. That's not some little weak, weasley, whiny, frail. That's why I don't like that. Oh, we're just sinners saved by grace. No, you so much more than that. You have sold yourself short. You can't be a sinner saved by grace and be a child of the Most High God. You can't be just an old sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner. You've been saved by grace. Now that's the gospel. That's the truth. See, so you, you can't be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and still be a sinner. You can't be the head and not the tail and above only and not beneath and still be a sinner. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will what? Grow up. How did they... How is the yoke destroyed? See, it'll, just, it'll destroy the yoke. It is true, the yoke can be destroyed. But in that verse, it's not about specifically somebody else's blessing and call upon their lives. It is still about Christ, though. Because we are what? We are growing up in Him, who is the head. Again, that is Christ. See, when you, when, when you grow in Christ, you just do this. You outgrow the yoke of the oppressor. Amen. You just outgrow it. You outgrow. Remember that, that one who comes to seek whom he may devour? But you outgrow his ability to devour you. Ephesians 6.10 says this, Finally, my brother, be what? Be strong where? In the Lord. Be strong where? In the Lord. You know, sometimes we're trying to be strong and it's not in the Lord. Be strong where? Be strong in the Lord. In what? And in the power of His might. You see this? This person's getting bigger spiritually. They're, they're growing. They're developing. I'm growing. I'm developing. See, if you grow in the Word... Your spirit gets stronger and bigger if you grow in the Word. Right? And you what? And you outgrow the yoke, and the yoke breaks. If you grow in faith, the Bible talks about exceeding growing faith. And now it's really true, and it's not what I said, it's what Jesus said. It'd be red letter stuff. Sometimes he looked at people and he said, I've not seen such great a faith in all in Israel. And you'll notice when he says that, somebody threw off an oppressor. Remember the Syrophesian woman whose daughter was sick? Threw off that oppressor. Then on the other hand, disciples about to drown in the storm, thank God for His grace and His mercy. And he says, why is it you have so little faith? And that happens. Sometimes you'll find in faith, your faith will ebb and flow. That's why you always are, you always, you always have to be growing. You always have to be growing. You grow in faith. Your spirit gets what stronger and bigger. Now let me show you, share something with you. You know that as you, uh, you know, as you age, there's just no way in the world to be at, you know, at 70 as strong as you were at 30. And you might take great care of yourself and you might be stronger than any other 70-year-old you know, but you're still not 30. Spiritually, it's not that true. There is no diminishing effects. See, if you grow in love, the Bible says, love never what? Why? It's big stuff. It's big stuff. It, it, it can forgive the hard stuff. It, it, it can walk where the petty can't. That kind of love doesn't, 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 lightly take, doesn't, doesn't easily take offense. Your spirit what? Your spirit gets stronger and your spirit gets bigger as you what? As you grow, as you nurture as you develop that love. If you grow in obedience, well, it's, always, uh, yeah, it's always important. When you hear the voice of God, the quicker you obey, the more it will do for your faith. I tell people, first thing you hear is God, everything else is rhetoric. 
Grow in obedience. Your spirit gets what? Gets stronger. Gets bigger. To obey is better than what? Isn't it? Yeah, it's better than sacrifice. When we de develop, when we grow, when we nurture the patience, what's growing? Our spirit is. It's good character. It absolutely is. But your spirit's getting bigger. It's getting stronger. How did they throw off the yoke? How did they break the yoke? How was it removed from their shoulders? Ultimately, how was it destroyed? Because what? Because they had grown. They'd grown fat. They'd what? They'd grown big. You and I grow fat as we grow in Christ. You know, I'm not talking about fat and lazy. I'm talking about strong. Strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. 1 John 3, 8 says this. What did the Son of Man come to do? Destroy. Everybody say destroy. This is, you see, this is part of his mission statement. He come what to destroy the works of the devil. He wants it destroyed in your life. He's done his part. We have to do our part. Again, Isaiah tells us that the burden should be taken off of our shoulders and from off of our neck. And the yoke should be destroyed because we have grown fat. See, Spiritual growth won't just throw the burden off. Spiritual growth will destroy the burden in your life. Literally destroy it. Let's bow our heads. Father, I love you. I am so grateful for truth. For truth that liberates and sets people free. God, we thank you. You might be here this morning and, and it may be that you've may, never made a <coughs> you've never made a decision concerning the person of Jesus Christ. But this morning could be your day. You could throw off a burden. You could break it. You could break the burden of being lost by an act of obedience. You can throw off the burden of sin by an act of obedience. Now again, that is true in so many other areas of our life. It could be fear, it could be worry, discouragement. But now we're talking about our relationship with God. Our eternal relationship. Everybody is an eternal being. We are all going to spend eternity somewhere. Christ came to make a way that we could escape heaven and find a rich reward in heaven through his suffering. So everything we've preached over the last few weeks applies to this. You can roll that burden of sin over on the Lord. You can take your unbelief your hurts, your pain, your difficulties in life. You can give it to Him. And He'll receive it and remove it from you. But you must call Him Lord. John, the first chapter says, For as many that believe upon Him, to them He gives the power. That means the right and the ability. Then it goes on to say to become the sons of God. So again, he's given you the, through belief in him, the ability to become a son of God. Romans 10 says this, that if we confess with our mouth, and if we believe in our heart, the Lord Jesus. In the 21st century, far too many people are looking for a savior, but they're not looking for a new Lord. He doesn't only want to sit on the throne of your heart, he wants to rule. You must make Him Lord of your life. That means you're surrendering control. He's not only taking your sin, He's taking the reins of your life. Romans 10, 9 and 10, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart we believe, with the mouth our confession is made. In just a moment, we're going to pray.
I ask folks all the time. Again, the question isn't, do you belong to church? Do you belong to a church? Do you have membership? Have you been baptized? Do you get a Sunday school pin? Those are all great things. I wouldn't make light of any of them, but that's not the question. Have you ever been saved? Do you know if you're born again? Has Christ come into your life? If he hasn't, let me ask you a few questions. Do you believe in Jesus? And you know, overwhelming majority of people in the United States would say, yes, I believe in Jesus. And I'd say, but that's a, that's a good thing because I'd rather live with people who believe in him. It affects and impacts our lives. But just believing in him doesn't make you a Christian. Do you believe he was a sinless son of God? They say, well, that's what they say. I have no reason. There's no reason not to believe that. Yeah, I believe that. I'd say, man, that is great. And you're, and, and you're near the kingdom, but that d doesn't mean you've been saved. Do you believe that he died and he died on the cross? And you say, yes. Yeah, I, I celebrate Easter. and I believe in Good Friday. I, I believe he died on the cross. Do you believe he was raised from the dead? You'd say, oh yeah, I believe that. Then you've only one thing left. You believe all the right things. You just have the one that you believe. You must invite him to become the Lord of your life. You give him your heart. When you give him your, your, your heart, he becomes your savior. He takes all your sin and he casts it as far as the east is from the west. The burden's removed. It's all in the person of Christ. But your act of obedience, your, your, your walking in that, your learning, <laughs> opens that door. We're going to pray in just a minute and we're going to invite everybody to pray with us. We want you to pray too. Let's pray together. If you don't know the Lord, would you pray? You might say, Bill, I've known the Lord, but I've wandered in my faith. Would you pray also? Let's just pray. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus. I believe that He lived. And I believe that He died. I believe He died for me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you now as my Lord and as my Savior. I receive forgiveness of sin and the free gift of eternal life. Old things are passed away. Everything's new. Thank you for a brand new heart. A brand new beginning. I am God's child. In Jesus' name, amen.